Are you guys ready for a bubble bursting episode? I am here today to show you something about reading strategy instruction that has to be um, dismantled. We got to burst a bubble, but don't worry. Before we leave, I will help you put the, ba the pieces back together and you'll understand how you can save time and get students to accelerate their reading achievement by carving away some things that are kind of uh, burdening you and you can move towards the things that are going to make the big difference for your students. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, Sherry. Hi, Carlene. I'm Marnie Ginsberg of Reading Simplified and it's my mission at Reading Simplified to help classroom teachers or anyone teaching reading streamline their reading instruction and also see if students' reading achievement accelerate. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. We're going to be bursting a balloon about reading strategy instruction so that you can save time and streamline your reading instruction. You won't have to ask yourself as many questions and you won't have to feel the guilt about all the different things that you're not teaching. All right. All right. Are you ready? Okay, enough say goodbye to our balloon. <laughs> All right, so I am so glad you're here. If you are here, let me know where you're from, what you teach. And I'd also love to know what you are experiencing with reading strategy instructions in terms of reading strategy instruction, rather. Are you experiencing that it's a big push to get it done? Are you experiencing a lot of um, demands in your scope and sequence or your reading curricula? Let me know where you're from, what you teach, and um, also can you share something about your experience with reading strategy instruction? Okay, so let's see what the bubble is that we are going to burst. Are you ready? Teaching reading strategies shouldn't take, be taking up so much of our time. I know that sounds surprising because we're reading about reading strategies instruction everywhere. It's coming at us from all different angles. And indeed, it is important. I'm not here to say that teaching reading strategies instruction um, isn't important. However, I want to give you a more nuanced understanding of it. So reading strategies, teaching students how to comprehend better by giving them tools like how to monitor their comprehension or how to learn to summarize or how to make connections. These things have been shown to make a difference for student reading achievement. They're proven by reading research, actually quite a lot of it in the last 30 to mostly 30 years. In fact, my um, doctoral advisor did some significant research on the importance of teaching kids story grammars. So I know very well that these are important things for us to share with our students. And yet, because they're kind of faddish, because there's a lot of books written about in them, um, maybe a couple di other th different things are going on. I think that we, particularly if we're teaching beginning or struggling readers, we feel weighed down by all that we have to teach. And we may not need to be spending as much time, as I said, in that. And let me show you why. I've got two reasons to tell you tonight of why we don't have to put so much time into the reading strategy um, instruction for, uh, for our literacy block. So if you've got beginning readers or anyone who's struggling, these principles apply to you. So here's a more nuanced understanding of reading strategy in instruction. Both of these points come from uh, UVA professor Daniel Willingham. So I really admire his work on this issue. So first thing that he points out that there have been meta-analyses, in other words, summaries of lots and lots of different research. And these meta-analyses indicate that reading strategy instruction is just as effective in six sessions as it is in 50 sessions. They're both equally effective. So who would want to spend 50 days teaching something that can be learned in six days, right? That's not what we want to do, right? So this is another example of streamlining your reading instruction. Don't do something over and over again simply because you're you're encouraged to do so. If you're already, if they've already learned the strategy, then the next thing you need to do is give them lots of practice. You don't have to reteach the strategy. So that's point number one. Um, six sessions can be just as good as 50 or 60. Okay. So yes, we are going to teach our students to monitor their comprehension. Yes, we're going to teach them to summarize. And then we're going to give them lots of opportunities to practice. We don't have to teach over and over again those strategies. Now let me give you an ex example of what I mean here by strategy 
versus skill and practice. So we have had a, a, a daughter, our oldest daughter recently learned how to drive a car. And so she, one of the things that as a strategy that good um, drivers are taught is that when they turn lanes, switch lanes, they, they need to look over their shoulder and check to see if there's a car in their blind spot, right? So a strategy for avoiding car wrecks is to check your blind spot. That is a, a, an aha, a concept, a notion that once she gets it ingrained, she doesn't need to be told, okay, this is a danger. It's a danger because of your blind spot for these and these reasons. And these are the steps you need to go through. She doesn't need that over and over again once she's got the concept and the idea. However, she's probably not super quick with that uh, strategy yet. She's not automatic with putting the skill into place. So when she's first doing it, she's very, you know, like all of us when we first learn to drive a car, um, we are anxious. What do we have to do? We have to first um, look in our side view mirror. Then we have to turn our head quickly. We also have to realize that we're not, we don't want to jerk the wheel because we're turning our body. Um, we need to check to see how far back a car is and see if we have room to switch into that lane. And all of those steps um, are hard initially because we don't have practice. We have to learn the skill through lots of repetition. But the strategy of checking your blind spot kind of comes naturally after a, a, a driving a session or two, one or two. And now it's just a question of does she have enough practice be changing lanes over and over again. What, she'll, what will happen is she'll get enough practice doing that activity of driving and having to switch lanes that she will get so good, it'll become automatic. She'll develop the automaticity to be able to talk with her friends, Switch, look back, check her blind spot, just turn lanes and put lipstick on and maybe turn off the radio or change the station, right? That's kind of what you develop as you are a more and more sophisticated driver because of practice, you develop automaticity. So it is with reading comprehension strategies. We learn that we have to be aware of our, our understanding. We have to be metacognitive. We learn that we have to pay attention and monitor our reading. But um, after we've got that aha, that concept, um, then we just need to put it into practice. We need to practice it with nonfiction text. We need to practice it with fiction text. We need to practice it with magazines. We need to practice it on the internet. We need to practice it with books. Hey, Robin, I'm glad you're here. If you want to share where you're from, anyone who's out there right now watching or later, let me know where you're from. And let me tell me a little bit about what reading comprehension strategy instructions like for you? Are you feeling this pressure that you have to do all of these things if you teach beginning readers or struggling readers? That's particularly interesting because we're talking about a nuance to the importance of it. So again, I'm saying, yes, it's important. Yes, we teach it, but we don't need to teach it for very long because the research indicates that six sessions is just as good as 60. Okay, so my second point, it, also from Daniel Willingham of UVA, is that again, meta-analyses, when there's lots and lots of research studies on this topic, and they condense the research, they have found that the benefit of these strategies for kindergarten through third grade readers is minimal. Yes, the big effect sizes where you get the impact for the, ben for the thing that you've done for the instruction really doesn't start till the fourth year of school. So if we're teaching kindergarten through third grade readers we shouldn't be doing that and calling it based on the research because it really isn't. The impact isn't there when we look for standardized achievement test growth based on um, that age demographic. And I particularly think it, it's probably related to that reading level. If you're reading at that level, that's probably not going to make a big difference. And so you may be thinking, well, that's kind of perplexing. Why is that? Well, we don't have this all pinpointed down, but these are some things that I think explain it. Um, when the student is beginning reading or struggling reading, they are putting a lot of their mental energy into decoding. Okay, so let's do this little analogy. Pretend this is this circle represents all the mental energy that a student has to be able to comprehend and get the point of a reading text, okay? So if they're developing readers, in other words, they're beginning, hey Flint, they're beginning readers or they've been struggling, and you think about all the mental energy that they're using, a lot 
of their mental energy is used for decoding, recognizing words or identifying words and reading it fluently. So, so much of their energy, their overall mental energy is used up, consumed by um, word identification. They don't have as much mental energy for the reasoning and the mental um, gymnastics that we do to understand something, particularly when we're encountering something that we don't have a lot of knowledge about. So this is particularly relevant, this model, this demographic for those beginning readers or anyone who's struggling. This is still their main block. So they just don't have as much energy here, mental space, if you will. Think of it like, you know, RAM and processing speed for your computer. When your, your processing speed is at the top of its uh, limits and the and you get a new program and, you pro and your computer can't handle it, it's like this you, because you have so much being taken up. It just There's not enough energy left over to do the thinking that's needed for comprehension. So in contrast, if a student is progressing and, and they're reading, reading chapter books or they're above the thir third grade reading level, the amount of mental energy, hypothetically speaking, was, would be like this. So they have, look at all the mental energy they have left over for reasoning, for summarizing, for monitoring their comprehension. So these are the two different profiles that we are teaching in our schools, particularly in elementary or anyone who's dealing with um, struggling readers. Okay, so if we um, have students with this profile where word identification is really the, sucking up all the mental energy and we put a lot of time, in other words, more than six sessions in general, into the, teaching comprehension strategies, we are missing out on really what's the main block for them. This is the main thing. And until we get this circle, this word ID circle, to look more like this circle, our time is not really best spent in teaching them to monitor their comprehension over and over again and teaching them to summarize over and over again. We will want them to practice those things, and I'm really big about that practice, uh, but when we're spending our time, particularly in small groups, our precious little time that we have in small groups, don't spend five to ten minutes every day dialoguing about the meaning of the text and asking them deeper things. Those are very valuable for read-alouds when you can do the whole class, interactive read-alouds. It's valuable after they've listened aloud to sophisticated text that's way up here. But this text, when they're working at this level, these texts actually aren't that demanding, right? If um, you were to read Magic Treehouse to a second grader aloud, how many of them would actually have problems comprehending it? Very few typically developing second grade readers can't get the point, can't make some inferences of a second grade text. The reason that they can't do it, however, when they're asked to read it themselves is because they just don't have as much mental energy because this is taking up so much um, mental um, steam, okay? So th those are the two reasons that I think that we should put reading comprehension strategies in their place so that we don't feel burdened as teachers like, we have kids who are behind in their word ID. We have kids that are not decoding well. We have kids that aren't fluent. And then we feel guilty. Well, oh my goodness, I need to be talking with them about their inferencing. Well, when they're not inferring, by and large, they're probably not inferring because they can't read all the words or they just don't have the background knowledge. The act of inferring the inferencing is actually probably not something that they're struggling with. If you give them text, that is in a subject area that they know something about and you read it to them, do they have trouble inferring it? That's an interesting question. Test it out if you don't believe me there. It's typical that a kid's inferencing ability is probably just fine, but it's hard for them when they're reading something that's either the words are too hard or the content is something they have little exposure to. So the strategy itself of inferring isn't really what's holding them back. It's either their word identification or lack of vocabulary or background knowledge. So when we're working in small groups, I really encourage us who are teaching beginning readers or anyone who's struggling to first deal with a big elephant in the room. Those kids need to learn how to decode, then those words will become automatic words. They'll have word identification, then they'll be even faster, they'll be automatic, they'll be fluent. That's the pattern, the, the order of things that we need to focus on for those kiddos when we're in small groups. When we have a whole group, we're going to read aloud something that's very challenging to them and we're going to dialogue with them, do think alouds and build their vocabulary 
and their content knowledge. And some of the time we may teach them some comprehension strategies, but mostly we need to develop their vocabulary and their background knowledge because that's what's going to um, make comprehension so much simpler. Okay, so let's just sum up. I um, did this rather claim that reading, stra reading comprehension strategies don't really merit as much time as we've been giving them um, for particular contexts. So we need to understand a nuanced view of these comprehension strategies. So what do I recommend? Uh, that this bubble that I'm bursting is that we don't spend all of your time feeling bad about reading comprehension strategies. Don't feel like you, sh you haven't done enough. Um, put it in its place. We know that it only benefits you in about uh, students in about six sessions. So it doesn't take uh, us to do it ad nauseum to get the impact. So who would want to do something 60 days in a row that they could accomplish in six? N none of us are doing that. But what I think can confuse us as teachers is we see kids not doing something that we think is a reading comprehension strategy. Oh, she's not inferring right there. Or, oh, he's not making connections right there. Now, I want you to discriminate between she wasn't able to do a strategy and she doesn't know how to do that strategy versus she doesn't have the background knowledge to make that strategy easy to accomplish. There's a big difference there. So whenever you see something, a, a strategy not being implemented, don't assume that they don't know how to do the strategy. Can they do the strategy when the text is easy, when, they're ha when the text is read aloud to them? Then the strategy isn't really the problem. The problem is either they don't know the words or they're too disfluent and it's taking up way too much mental energy so they don't have time and space to think deeply or they just don't know the information. Now, there is a really interesting series of research studies that backs this up. Hi, Laura. If you guys are just popping in, let me know where you're from. I'm bursting some bubbles about reading comprehension strategies. And um, I want to tell you one more little thing. And I, but if you have uh, one little tip and to kind of bolster your, your, your thoughts about this in case you doubt what I'm saying, because I know I'm going against the grain here. This is very um, non I am bursting some bubbles, so let me give you a little bit more research. But if you're just coming in, let me know what you have experienced about reading comprehension strategy instruction. Are you pressed to do it? Um, is it in a, every day of your curricula? Let me know. I'd love to hear from you, either now um, live or later on. I'll be following up on this, this uh, video. So one other little interesting data point. Back to that question of when a student doesn't infer, is it the strategy that they're poor at or is it the lack of knowledge? So there's a whole bunch of research studies um, that have shown when students and even adults, when they're given something to read that they know a lot about, um, then they comprehend it well. And they've even done some interesting studies when they look at poor readers and, and good readers. And they both give them something like a, something uh, like about baseball. Well, guess what? If you are a poor reader who knows a lot about baseball, you can do just as well as a good reader who knows nothing about baseball. So it's the background knowledge that, that helps fill in all the gaps for that poor reader. And they can succeed way above expectation because they have the background knowledge. So, they might read something about second base and, uh, and sh shuttling home and they make some inferences because they know so much about baseball. Whereas if I hear a couple of sentences where the lines aren't connected for me, because I'm not a baseball fan, I may not be able to make those connections. That doesn't mean that I don't have the uh, inferencing ability. It just means I lack um, background knowledge. So that's why when I'm talking about the read aloud, um, or the listening along and you discuss it afterwards, it's really important to build their background knowledge, to um, discuss vocabulary, to exaggerate vocabulary, to write it on the board, to have them use it, to use it in sentences, to make connections from today's text with yesterday's text, tying in vocabulary and concepts over time and across the year so that they build up larger and larger volumes of information about the world so that they can comprehend. Because really, um, reading research has shown 
that being a good comprehender is mostly about knowing a lot about the world. It's easier to read a little bit of everything if you know a little bit about everything. So I got off to a point, the little bit of the point, um, but the main point to take take away is that uh, reading teaching of reading comprehension strategies shouldn't take up so much of our time. We can teach it in just a few sessions and then give students lots of opportunities to practice it. And also it has a lot less of an impact when our kids aren't reading at a fluent level fourth grade and up. So uh, let me know, what do you think about these bursting ideas? I'd love to hear your opinion. If you disagree, that's great. Share with me and we can um, dive deeper into this topic. If you agree, that's great too. Let me hear from you. Um, again, we will be back here at Reading Simplified. We will be back um, today. Usually I try to aim for um, 7 p.m. Eastern. So I picked a different time this week, but usually Tuesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll be going live with ways that you can help um, your students uh, accelerate their reading achievement, but at the same time, ways in which you can relax about the reading instruction because you know what your, what the, the, your priorities are. Um, okay, we got a great um, I, suggestion of ideas here from Joanne. And so while I read that, first let me just snag something that I promised you. Um, <clears throat> There's a little freebie. If you want to teach any, any um, comprehension strategy. The first one to teach is summarization. So you can get this bookmark about to cue you on how to teach summarization and how to give your kids a lot of practice. You can get this here at this website that I'm about to drop in the links. And then I look forward to reading what Joanne had to say to us. Um, so let me just drop this. Here is the link where you can download this little bookmark on how to um, coach your students with comprehension, with particularly with summarization, because that's really the most important um, comprehension strategy. So Joanne suggests this. I, she's teaching students how to decode, but also to think about what they're reading. Yes, in use of context, so they have to understand what they're reading. Lots and lots of reading practice, absolutely, because that's going to shrink this circle and move them to uh, be like this. But she struggles with how much of my time to spend with them on teaching the decoding skill, for such as all the ways to read the O sound, or just have them learn these decoding skills through lots of practice reading text. I know you have research to prove that unless we teach those word identification skills, readers will get to a point and struggle to move on with their reading level. So I depend on the classroom teachers and parents to provide the reading practice. Oh, okay, so interesting. Well, it's a short period of time. If you're using Reading Simplified, strategies. Um, we move kids pretty rapidly up this continuum. It typically takes 12 weeks for first grade and up. If they're struggling fifth graders or um, if they are struggling first graders, it's about 12 weeks of decoding practice. Maybe it'll be 24 weeks, but it's a fairly concentrated time because the activities are pretty efficient. So because of that efficiency, um, during the small group time when you're really zeroing in on making this circle turn into this circle, uh, I'm suggesting that most of your emphasis is not at that time in small groups about building background knowledge. But if you have the classroom teeth, uh, it sounds like you are, when you're saying learning assistance, you mean you don't have access to the kids all day. Yes, the teacher, um, the elementary teacher, across the course of the day, I really hope that she's doing a lot of reading aloud and talking with kids and helping them make connections so they build the background knowledge, they build vocabulary knowledge. So in the small group setting, when you're really, your goal is first and foremost to shrink this circle and get them fluent ASAP, then no, background knowledge is definitely secondary. Um, however, when words come up, for instance, if you're doing switch it and you say, okay, let's move, um, let's switch from uh, glint, like I saw a glint in his eye to flint. Well, that's a perfect time to briefly define the words or use it in a sentence, but we're not going to belabor it and spend two minutes on it. We're just going to define it and use it in a sentence and move on in general. So I hope that kind of gives you a sense of the, uh, the proportions of things. All right. So it seems like, Joanne, if you have something, do you have a follow-up with that? I don't know. Did I, did I hit your question? Maybe we could talk about it now. If not, we can carry this conversation off into... Um, the comments later. Again, make sure that you go to the link that I just dropped so you can snag your bookmark because comprehension strategies are important, 
but we don't have to teach them how to do it over and over again. We just need to teach them that they need to do it and then they need to practice it with wide reading. So that bookmark that you find in that link will teach you about, I will guide you on how to coach kids to be good comprehenders, which is the most important comprehension skill that we need to get at the beginning. All right, so thanks for being here. I am Marnie Ginsburg at Reading Simplified. If you wanna know more about us, um, go to readingsimplified.com and we'll be back next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Take care.